Thank you everyone for joining. Today's topic is building single page applications with Grails and the Vue JavaScript library. Your presenter today is Zach Klein. Zach is a senior software engineer here on the Grails team at OCI. And with that, I turn it over to you, Zach. Thank you, Nikki. Welcome, everyone. This is a single page apps with Grails and Vue.js. And I am Zachary Klein, senior software engineer here at OCI. Um, give me a second here. Got to get my controls arranged uh, so I can see my, my screen. So uh, I've been working at OCI since about uh, uh, 2015. And uh, I've been doing web development for a bit longer than that. Um, with a mixture of both backend and front end development. And so these days I do a lot of work with Grails and with Micronaut, as well as doing uh, front end development and training and other things uh, alongside of that. And I'm based out here in St. Louis, Missouri, where the OCI office um, also resides. Uh, a couple of things I just want to point out, just I, I like to put, put these uh, websites out just in case folks are, are not aware of them. Uh, the Grails application forge, start.grails.org. This is the place to go to start creating a new Grails application. And that would include a Grails application with Vue.js because there is a Vue.js profile that's available from the application forge. And also, uh, just in case you haven't heard yet, uh, Grails 4 RC1 is out and is also available from uh, the application forge. So definitely recommend if you're wanting to play with Grails or get started with a new project, that is the place to go. And, and then that also. Oh, we have a question about that. Is okay. this webinar going to be focused on Grails 3 or Grails 4? Excellent question. So actually, uh, both uh, very little changes as far as the single page application development flow um, with Grails 4. Um, so the sample code I'm going to be showing will be Grails 4. Uh, the code in the slide is taken from a Grails 3 project. However, I don't think you're going to see any differences uh, because the, the improvements and the, the, the features in Grails 4 uh, reside nicely alongside the existing single page application support in Grails 3. So um, whatever you learn here will apply to both. Good question. And then uh, also the Grails guides website, check that out. We have several guides on Vue.js actually uh, specifically available there, but lots of other topics, lots of neat tricks and uh, very practical um, solutions are available there. So uh, that's a, aside from the user guide and documentation, uh, this is definitely the place to go when you're looking for um, some official uh, sample code and, and uh, tutorial sort of uh, uh, documentation uh, for Grails. And there, there's equivalent site, of course, for Micronaut as well, but that's not the topic today. So uh, our agenda, we're gonna introduce Vue.js and this is a lot to pack into uh, a one hour webinar. So I'm gonna have to move fairly fast but I'm gonna to try to introduce the Vue.js library and then I'm gonna go into um, some uh, features with Gra uh, features in Grails specific to building applications with Vue.js, especially single page applications. And then we're gonna look a little bit into um, JWT uh, RESTful security uh, with Spring Security. And um, in our demo, we're gonna show kind of all that stuff pulled together. And if we have time, we're going to fit in a little demo on um, packaging up a Grails and Vue.js application into a single deployable artifact uh, jar file. So that'll be the bonus if we can get through the rest of the material uh, in, in time. So let's jump right in. So what is Vue? Uh, hopefully most folks joining here have some idea of, of what Vue.js is, and that's why you're interested. Um, but I'll give a quick uh, bit of background here. Uh, Vue.js is a Vue library, um, and I imagine that's probably where the name came from. Um, and it's uh, a lot of things going for Vue. One of the, my favorites is that considering how new the library is, it was only released, I believe, in 2014 was the initial uh, release. And then um, the current major version, I believe, is a couple years uh, after that. Um, it's a very, it has a very mature ecosystem. Um, there's a lot, it's, Vue is a Vue library, and so it doesn't have a lot of the features like state management and other things that a lot of JavaScript and front-end developers want. But there are, for the most part, there are official um, libraries and solutions built up around Vue. Um, generally speaking, if you need something, if you need a router, if you need state management, there is a widely accepted option um, or library out there ready for you to, to use. And so uh, the ecosystem is, is very full-featured. Um, I've not found anything 
that I wanted to do where I needed a library and couldn't find one for Vue.js. So that's pretty impressive considering how new the library is. Uh, it's got a, a ton of uh, features here. This is just, a, I, I picked out the dev tools because I find them particularly helpful. Um, Vue has a very active community, community uh, very actively developed. And then uh, we will talk a little bit about how Vue stacks up with Angular and React. I mean, that's a whole topic of, in and of itself. But I will give at least my high level impressions of kind of where Vue stands in comparison to Angular and to React, since those are its two biggest um, competitors in the front end space these days. So to get started with Vue, the easiest way and the best way is to use the Vue CLI. Uh, version 3 was released. Um, several months ago now, and um, it makes it really trivial to get started. Um, so you will need to have NPM, and that will mean Node uh, installed in order to run this command. Um, but once you do, you install Vue slash CLI, and that will give you access to the Vue CLI, and you can just run a command like Vue create project, and that will generate a fully bootstrapped Vue.js project with all the configuration you need. Um, it's a very full-featured CLI. And uh, that makes it really easy to get started um, building an actual view application. If we have time, I might show a, a quick demo of what that looks like um, in a moment here. Uh, that said, to really get started with a view, you don't even need Node or NPM. Um, view is a very uh, minimalistic library, and you can actually get started simply on a page of HTML, like what you're seeing here. So this is a snippet from an HTML page, no other JavaScript anywhere on the file system uh, for this project. Uh, you just need to have some way of bringing in the view library itself. Um, so you can do that with a script tag, and, or, or you can obviously grab the, the JavaScript source itself and add it to your project. And then you, you just initialize a view instance. We'll talk about that in a moment. And you're up and running. Uh, you can start using all the key features of the view library from that point. You don't need Webpack. You don't need any build tooling. Um, very easy to get started in this fashion. Um, I would not recommend it if you're looking at actually building a real app and starting to um, you know, do anything with any complexity. Uh, although I will say that if you're not building a single page application and you just want to int introduce Vue into an application that let's say is using jQuery or maybe it's a Grails application and you're using GSP, um, what the code you see here is perfectly viable uh, and you really could start to build little portions of your app um, as Vue components using an approach like this. Uh, you just would not want to build a single page application uh, with this approach. And that's what we're talking about today. Um, so yes, uh, the highlighted section there, that is the view instance. That's where the magic starts to happen. And um, we'll talk more about the view instance right now. So a view instance is really the ground zero for any Vue.js application or Vue.js sub component um, if you're using it in a, in a non single page um, uh, context. Um, the view instance is instantiated, obviously, with a uh, new view, and then you pass it an object, which is referred to, generally speaking, I see it referred to as the instance definition. That's what I call it. So that object you see there with all these keys, um, EL, uh, which is for element, uh, data, methods, template, all those keys exist within this instance definition object. And that object, it follows the same sort of conventions, whether you're creating an instance with new view um, on the left there, or on the right-hand side, we're, doing, we're creating a component. And I'll explain the difference there in um, just a minute. But you'll notice that um, the, when you, when you uh, define a view component, you basically export that instance definition object. And that's really what you're doing. You're basically saying, OK, here is the object that I want to be used, that I want to have used to create my view component. And so behind the scenes, view uh, is going to basically call a new view on that object. So this object is kind of uh, the important thing. And one of the nice things about Vue is that you can really kind of grow into the library by simply learning the new keys and new um, features that are supported by this object. So you might start off with just something really simple like element and data, for example. And I'll explain what those are. And then as you get more comfortable with it, now you add some methods. And then you might add a template and so forth. And so um, the 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 api is really uh, easy to learn in that way because you just start off with a minimal object and add on features as you need them uh, so i'm just going to highlight a few of those uh keys uh, that get passed into the view instance um, el which is for element that's a pretty important one um, you need this in order to create a view application and render it somewhere on an html page so the purpose of the uh, element key 
is to specify a DOM element. So typically it's gonna be something like a div where you want your app to render. Normally you will only do this once if you're writing a view application, if you're writing a single page app, for example, because you only want to start rendering to the HTML page in one place. Um, you will have view components that will be rendered inside of that div that will be rendered inside of this element, but you don't re render to multiple elements. So typically you will only do this for your top level view instance. And when we look at the sample code, uh, you'll, you'll see what I mean there. Um, the next really important one is data. Uh, data really expresses the state. So if you're familiar with React, uh, this is the equivalent, equivalent to the state object in a React component. Um, so that the data object is, uh, describes the data within this view instance. Um, and notice I have here app slash component. Uh, again, we'll talk about the distinction in a minute, but that essentially means an instance versus a component. Um, they both have a data function or a data object rather. And the data objects properties are subjected to reactive rendering. And so that means that when you update something in the data object, anywhere else where it's being used is going to also be um, updated. And so you have basically two-way binding as well as one-way binding. You can really uh, do both ways. And uh, if you're not familiar with one-way and two-way binding, um, it's not really important to this particular webinar, but if you're familiar with React or Angular, you'll probably know what I'm talking about there. Uh, the important part is that Vue handles both. Um, you could add new properties to your data object. However, when you add a new property, at least in the current versions of Vue, uh, that new property will not be subjected to that reactive updating. And so typically what you wanna do is you wanna have all of the, the keys, all of the properties in your state defined up front, even if they're blank or null. Um, and then from then on, you can update them and they'll respond accordingly. And the last point to mention uh, is that if you're, when you're uh, creating a view component, uh, you have to actually return your object from a data function. It's not simply an object. And this next slide will show you what I mean there. So on the uh, left-hand side, we're creating a new view instance. Again, this is more, what you're more likely to do when you're creating your view app from scratch or when you're, just, you, when you're creating the top level um, component uh, in your application. And you see there the data key has an object, which is the state for this view instance. We have my value, we have my object, which is an object which has a property itself. Now on the right-hand side, we're defining a view component. And the important thing there is that we still have the same data object, but it's being returned from a function called data. And uh, there's an important reason for that that we probably won't have time to go into. But when you see the examples, uh, it's not hard to remember. Uh, when you're writing components, you use a function. And realistically, most of the time, you are writing components. You're not putting data into your uh, top level view instance like you see on the left. So it's not, not as confusing as it might seem here. You almost always will be doing uh, what you see on the right hand side of, of the slide. A bunch of other, th the view instance supports lots of other things and I don't have time to go into detail on any of them. I'm just gonna highlight uh, three of them uh, that I think we'll probably make use of in this webinar. Uh, methods, methods is going to be, the, the key methods will um, have a value that is an object, which is simply a, um, a bunch of functions. So you write, if you have any sort of uh, behavior you wanna to add to your component, for example, um, you can define a function within this methods block and that function can access and manipulate the data, the state for the, the instance. And that method can also be called from a template. It can be called as an event handler. Um, computed uh, refers to computed properties. These are also functions, but they work a little differently they are functions that are actually accessed as though they were properties, as though they were part of your state. So if you had a function, let's say um, uh, current date uh, as a computed property, you would refer to it as though it was just a property in your state called current date. However, that, current, that computed property is actually a function that might calculate the date, for example. Um, that's probably not a realistic example because what you really wanna do with computed is you can perform, a di di you can, uh, return dynamic values based on things in your states. Let's say you have some numbers in your, uh, in your instance uh, data. You can have a computer property that computes some uh, algorithm based on those values. Now the cool thing is, is that Vue will actually cache that result so that unless the data variables change, the function will not be called again. The, the cached value will be returned instantly. So that's the advantage of computed over a simple method is that so long as you're relying on data within your component, um, it can actually cache those results and um, save you a lot of, uh, a lot of computation time, um, depending on what kind of work you're doing. Uh, 
And then life cycle methods, uh, if you're familiar with React or Angular, you probably know what these are about. These are special functions that are called by Vue at certain points along the, uh, the Vue's, uh, the, the instance life cycle. So for example, when a component is created, there is a created function that can be called. So you implement that created function, um, it's sort of the equivalent of the component did mount in React for those that are familiar with React. Um, but that function is going to be called. Um, and we'll see examples of that quite a bit. It's a very popular one. And there's other, there's a lot of lifecycle methods and the view documentation describes all of them. Uh, view templates are essentially HTML. You can actually use JSX. Uh, so if you're familiar with React, that is an option. You can use JSX in view and that works just fine, but it's not typical. Most folks will use the HTML based template. Um, and you'll notice here that if you're familiar with Angular, it's quite similar. We have things like a V dash model. So we have directives um, that can uh, be used for data binding. There's uh, logical di uh, directives. Unfortunately, I don't have, I tried to turn on my, um, my laser pointer and it's not working. So I can't highlight these things. Hopefully people are following along. Uh, but if you look down there kind of towards just below the midsection of this code snippet, you can see we have a V if directive. So you can do conditional logic. We have uh, a V4 down there uh, for iteration. Uh, if you look towards the very bottom, there's an at click um, attribute on that button towards the bottom of the code snippet. And that's calling a, a method that's going to be defined probably in our methods uh, section of our instance. And that's going to be that's setting up an event handler for the click event. So I'm, I'm not going to detail the syntax right now. We just don't have time for that. But hopefully you can see it's, it's pretty intuitive uh, if you're familiar at all with basic event handling in JavaScript and HTML. And if you're familiar with Angular, this will look very similar to you, uh, other than the, the V prefix uh, for the directives. And uh, we'll see more examples of just quest specific questions when we look at code. I can um, hopefully clear those up. Um, but that's the templating syntax. And then uh, lastly, okay, components. So um, a view instance can be a component, or it can just be a standalone instance of the view object. Right, so when it's a component, what does that mean? A component means that the view instance has a template and that it's you know, set up in such a way that it can be rendered um, as a child of another component. So it can be in, in, within another component's template, right? So once you, a view instance is simply a component, a view, I'm sorry, a view component is a view instance that is uh, made into a component. It has its own template. It can be rendered in place. It can be rendered onto another template. And so typically the way you do that, you can create components um, just with straight JavaScript. However, what's going to be much more uh, typical is, is to create these .view files. And a .view file combines the template section you see there at the top. That's the template, we were, uh, that's the template syntax we were just looking at. And then has a script section, which exports that um, default object, which is the instance definition we were talking about. So that's basically saying, you know, to the, the build tool, and, there, and uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, there's build tooling involved here. But that'll basically tell the build tool that this, uh, this block of uh, JavaScript, this object is gonna be used to, to instantiate a, a view component. And then finally, there's a style section. And this allows you to have um, style sheets that are specific to your component. So this uh, format with um, a template, a script section, and a, a style section makes up the .view file. Now, a .view file does require build tooling. So you'll recall with our very simple example at the beginning, you don't need any build tooling. You can just go straight ahead with um, straight HTML and JavaScript. When you want to start building with components, you're going to probably want to use um, some of the build tooling. For example, you'll use the, if you use the view CLI, that's all set up for you. But you're going to want to use that because you have to process, you have to pre-process these .view files. Obviously, a browser isn't going to know how to read them. Um, but they do make the development experience with Vue much more pleasant. And so I, I'm not even showing the other way of creating components because I don't recommend it. I think this is, this is um, definitely the most uh, accessible way to create components. And again, we're going to see examples of this um, shortly here. In fact, I think at this point, I'm going to jump into a very quick demo. Um, so let me jump out of the slide deck here. I'm going to check this QA real fast and see what we have. Um, Okay, so I see some, some folks saying that this has become a Vue.js introduction. Yes, I apologize. We're about done with that part. But um, if you look at the agenda, that is the first section is a Vue.js Vue introduction. So believe me, I could go into much more detail. However, I just want to do enough to make sure that we are all on the same page. Um, looks like my uh, ID may be shut down on me. So give me a second here. Well, actually, I'm just going to jump to the um, terminal. <laughs> 
There we go. Okay, here we go. All right. So I've already got the view CLI installed here. So I'm just going to create a project real fast. So bear with me. Um, let's see, talks. All right. So I'm going to say view. I have the view CLI already installed. So I say view, create, and then hello world. And this is going to generate a project. Um, I'm not going to walk through all the options. Uh, the CLI lets you pick a, lo a lot of different options um, for uh, how you want your, your project to behave. And once that generates, I'm going to go ahead and open it in WebStorm. Should be open here in just a minute. Questions here. All right, our project is built. I'm going to go ahead and open it up now in a web storm. We'll take a really quick look around just so you can see. I want to highlight a couple of things I was talking about. Oops, I, think I picked the wrong file. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of things I was talking about just so you're, everyone's clear on the difference between a component and an instance, especially since I know that, that at least for me, that was um, a bit confusing when I was first getting started. So let me just open this up real fast. There we go. All right, so hopefully that's big enough for everyone to see. I'm gonna jump down here into the source directory. There's a component directory. So if we take a look here at uh, main.js, this is sort of the bootstrap uh, file that sets up the, the, the single page view application. And notice that this is where the new view instance is being installed, I'm, is being instantiated. I'm not gonna talk about the details here. The point is that this is where you're seeing new view. And now the other, uh, in, the, in the view components, like for example, the app component here, uh, this is a component we're simply exporting our definition object. We have our template. Notice in this template here, we are using another component. And this is how you know this is, that you're dealing with components here. Components can be embedded within other components templates. And so I can click here into hello world and I can see the hello world um, components right here. This is running out a bunch of markup. Um, I'm not going to spend much more time on this. I just wanted to point out the difference there between setting up. So again, you're going to typically do this new view when you're creating a new application and you just want to kick things off and then you'll use components from then on. Okay, let's see here. Let's jump back to the code. So uh, real briefly, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Vue versus Angular and React. I'll spend no more than a minute on this. Uh, the short story is that Vue takes a lot of good ideas from Angular, but makes it much uh, simpler. Um, the, the learning curve for Vue is much lower than with Angular, uh, in my opinion. Um, I find that Vue code is much more uh, readable and more straightforward because there's not a lot of, of boilerplate and overhead. By comparison, I'm not saying this is a bad thing about Angular. There's a reason why Angular works the way it does. Um, however, especially for folks that are new to front-end development, um, I often find that Vue is one of the easiest uh, frameworks uh, to introduce them to. So, um, but you know, with that said, Vue is not technically a framework. It is a Vue library. And as a result, there are things that you're likely going to need to add on um, in addition to the core library, um, which is very similar to React. And so Vue is really uh, very much a, a, a sibling as far as uh, where it sits in the front end space with React. Very similar conceptually, um, uh, the way the component model works, the reactivity, the virtual DOM, which we didn't talk about, lifecycle methods. Um, you can use JSX with Vue. Um, in my experience, Vue tends to simplify some things over React. However, um, it does so by being a little more pragmatic. And there's times where the React way might be a little more programmatically simple um, versus Vue, which might have a little more um, uh, magic going on behind the scenes. Um, I find it strikes a, a nice balance. Um, I like all three of these frameworks. I actually prefer React myself if I'm just coding on my own, but I think Vue has a lot going for it. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how do we use this stuff with Grails. Um, so uh, if you're familiar with Grails 3, uh, you probably know that we have these, uh, this idea of profiles, uh, which basically are um, bootstrapped uh, pre-configurations um, pre -configurations for Grails projects. So we have profiles for creating REST, RESTful applications. We have a profile for just a standard Grails web application. And we also have several profiles for single page application um, projects. Uh, for example, we have one for Angular, we have one for React, and we do have one for Vue. 
and um, the uh, the uh, view profile is the newest, but they all basically follow the same sort of structure. So um, before we get into that, let's talk about why we might want to use Vue and other JavaScript frameworks with Grails. Now, this on this, I'm really talking about the angle of why should you consider using Grails as a back end for these things. I mean, Grails has, still has a lot going for it. Uh, the convention over configuration, the developer productivity, the fact that you really do have great compatibility with Spring Boot. Um, the Gradle build tool gives you a lot of flexibility, especially when you actually want to start pulling in uh, front end related things. There's uh, lots of cool Gradle tricks to make that uh, more seamless. Uh, Grails is really ideal for creating RESTful controllers. Um, JSON views is one of my favorite features of Grails, and I make use of that a lot. And then GORM, of course, uh, for persistence. And um, especially, I, I really like the GORM GraphQL support. I find that really compelling. And GraphQL is really fun to, to code against uh, with Vue, as well as other front end um, libraries. So Grails has a lot going for it. Now, the reason why you might want to consider using Vue uh, on top of your Grails application, uh, a lot of that's kind of do simply, simply to, um, let's see, why use Grails at all instead of Micronaut as a bag? That's kind of off topic here. Um, you can use Micronaut if you want. Uh, if you're building microservices, I would definitely recommend Micronaut. But that's a much broader topic. So um, this webinar is about uh, Grails and Vue. So um, we're going to uh, keep on that track for now. Uh, we can talk more about that at the end, perhaps. Um, so. The, uh, the reasons why you might want to use Vue as opposed to GSPs, for example, um, is that you're going to get a much more modern front end uh, development experience. Um, and these days, that's where you know, the front end development interest is going to be. And there's a lot of advantages to the newer fr frameworks. Um, you know, there, there is some complexity, but they do bring a lot of really rich behavior to the table. And um, I, I've personally found them to be you know, uh, quite, quite um, fun to develop uh, with, uh, to be honest. And so, um, there's a, a lot of reasons why you might want to consider moving to a single page application with Vue or with React, for example, w on your existing Grails app. And the cool thing is that you don't have to do this all at once. You can do this piecemeal. Um, Vue especially is very, uh, very uh, amenable to um, uh, creating subcomponents of your UI as Vue components, for example, and just rendering them in a sp specific div. You don't have to go single page application all at once. Although that's going to be basically the, the approach we'll see um, going forward here. So there's uh, several approaches to using JavaScript frameworks with Grails. And I, I've, I have a whole talk on this subject. And so we're just going to really briefly uh, jump over this. Uh, there is the asset pipeline, uh, which is a really cool front end uh, tool. It does support Vue, um, although it's uh, it's, uh, kind of new. Um, uh, but the, the approach we're going to talk about, and this is the approach taken by the view profile, so I'm not going to really uh, go over this slide. Um, the approach that we take in the view profile is what I call the multi-project build. The idea here is that we are going to have a separate standalone uh, client application, which is in this case going to be our Vue.js application. It's going to have a RESTful, a REST API Grails application. So that means no GSPs, uh, no asset pipeline, just JSON views and RESTful controllers. And the uh, server project is going to expose an API to the uh, client project, and the client project will consume it. And that's going to be your basic architecture for this application. So if you're using the view profile, this is what you get by default. No extra work has to be done. Everything's going to be configured for you. It is a, multi it is a great old multi-project build, which gives us some cool um, uh, abilities that we might get to look at a little bit later, um, because it allows us to use Gradle to um, kind of combine the build processing between the two projects and um, even 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 to the level of the, the, the uh, NPM and, and node based um, build tasks. So Gradle's awesome and uh, makes this sort of approach really feasible. So that's sort of the, the high level uh, what it looks like. So to use the view profile, um, you can obviously go to start.grails.org and select the view profile there. At the bottom, you can see that curl command. Uh, so you can actually uh, from the command line, you can generate your project um, that way. And then you can also, if you have Grails installed um, and you're using the create app, create app command, just pass the profile flag and pick view. So it's a core Grails profile. Um, it's actively maintained. I maintain it and um, I intend to keep it up to date. And um, it's, that's where we're gonna be, that's the, the sample project we're looking at from now on is gonna be built with this uh, view profile. So just a quick um, kind of a tour of how the profile works. So the, the Grails server application is using the REST API profile. So you know that's um, it, it's a profile within a profile. So hopefully that's not too confusing. But 
the view profile creates a Grails application that is using the REST API profile, if that makes sense, because they are two separate applications. And that's ideal because if you're building a single page application, then your back end doesn't really need to render HTML or anything like that. It can just expose um, RESTful endpoints and then we'll consume those uh, via Ajax from our uh, single page application. And then of course we have to have uh, cores, cross origin uh, resource, uh, and I, I forgot what the S stood for. Uh, we have to have cores support enabled, which is honestly trivial in uh, Grails these days, but it is set up for you um, by default. Now on the client side, the front end project, this is built using the Vue CLI. And in the, the current RC of Grails 4, this is built with the latest version of the CLI. So I have upgraded that. Um, you're going to make use of a REST client in order to um, communicate back to the server to grab data from it, for example. And that's already set up for you. And then there's also going to there also is a, a custom UI skin over the, the default view CLI um, just to make it more um, uh, uniform with Grails. Um, so to use to fire it up, um, it's you can use uh, npm. So the the uh, front end view project has a package.json file, and you can run npm start, npm install, all those sorts of commands will, will work. Um, however, we also have the Gradle node plugin engaged here. So in addition to being a straight view CLI project, there's also a build.gradle file within this uh, front end uh, view project. And that plugin allows us to actually delegate the NPM and the, the uh, front end um, build uh, steps to Gradle. And what does that mean? Well, it means that instead of having to have Node and NPM installed and run NPM install and NPM start, for example, you can actually run those all with Gradle commands. So you can run as Gradle tasks, you can run Gradle client colon start. So client is the sub project, start is the task, there are Gradle tasks that basically are aliases for all of the default uh, NPM scripts. Uh, this actually is more impressive maybe than you might seem because what it means is that if you have, for example, a front end team that's working on the view side of the project, um, those folks probably are comfortable with Node and with NPM or Yarn or whatever their preferred tooling is. And they can actually use that tooling natively. They don't need to touch Gradle. They don't need to worry about that at all. They can fire up the application they can run tests, they can do whatever they want in the front end side without needing to you know, fire up Java at all. However, for the back end developers, the guys working on the, on the server project, for example, they don't need to worry about having Node installed. They can use Gradle to delegate those tasks and the Gradle Node plugin will actually, in the background, uh, download and cache an installation of, of Node and of NPM and whatever other, other tooling is needed. Um, and this means that uh, front end and, and, and uh, back end developers each can stick with their own uh, set of tools. The back end guys can keep using, the uh, back end folks can keep using Gradle. The front end folks can be using NPM or, or what have you. Um, and so I found in my, in my experience, this does make for a nice development experience. Even for me, I tend to be working on both sides because I do back end development as well. But there's times where the NPM tools are a little bit faster, or just a little more handy than running a Gradle command. And so it's really cool to have the option to do both in the same project without any special configuration. Again, this is all what you get by default. This is how the profile, the view profile is set up uh, by default. Um, let's move on from there. Um, oops, hang on. Uh, object marshaler. Um, the question about using object marshaler, that's basically about an alternative to JSON views. Uh, the answer is yes, but we really do recommend JSON views over marshallers uh, these days. And then the view profile does not include a login page, but we will see an example of that in our sample today. And uh, the code will be available so you can take a look at that. Uh, but no, there's no security set up by default um, with the, the view profile. So, uh, oops, I skipped over some things there. Um, hang on. Okay, so yeah, the advantages of the, of the Gradle Node plugin is that you can standardize Node versions. You don't have to worry about making sure everyone's running the same version of Node because the build.gradle file will specify the version. Um, it installs Node project locally, so you can have different versions of Node on different projects with no conflicts. And then, as I said, it delegates um, any NPM or Yarn tasks that you need to run. So really handy plugin, a big advantage, in my opinion, of using Gradle. In fact, I often will throw a Gradle file into a standalone view project, even if I'm not using Grails, just because um, I find it really handy. It, uh, I, don't, I no longer have to worry about making sure I have the right version of Node installed, and that's cool.
So to fire this stuff up, um, I, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, <laughs> I got some weird animations here. Um, you can fire up the uh, back end project just like you would normally. You can run Grail's run app or Gradle boot run, and that's going to fire up the back end server. That's the Grail server. It'll run on port, uh, look, port 8080 as, as normal. And then this, uh, you can access that endpoint, and you'll get back the default JSON that you would see if you're building any other Grails REST API. Uh, if you're familiar with that profile, instead of getting the index GSB page, you just get a, a, a uh, index of JSON that has a bunch of application metadata. Separately then in a separate terminal session, you're gonna run either Gradle start on the client project, or you can run NPM start. And that view project is gonna run on port 3000 by default. And that's gonna be your view application. And it's gonna communicate with the back end. So you'll wanna start the back end up first. Uh, it'll communicate with the back end. It'll retrieve that same metadata you would normally see in the GSP homepage on a Grails project, and it will display there like normal. Let's see here. Spring, can we use Spring Security Core plugin? Absolutely, you can. We'll get to security here shortly. Uh, I think we've gotten all the questions I see there, I think have all been answered. Um, and then the last thing, this is, uh, we'll try to have time, hopefully we'll have time to show this uh, at the end here. We're about to go into our, our main demo, which is where we'll spend the rest of the, of the webinar. Um, but uh, one of the cool things about the multi-project build with Gradle is that it allows you to do some cool things. Like, for example, you can, and this, this diagram, I apologize, is showing a, a React logo because I pulled it from a React talk, but it, it's completely irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. It can be view, it could be Angular. But what uh, you can do with uh, Gradle, with a multi-project build, you can actually run the front-end um, build. You can you know, uh, create the production version of your Vue.js project, for example, and copy it into your uh, Grails application. And what that means is that you can generate uh, a single uh, jar file or war file. And the example we'll see is gonna be using an executable jar file. But you can have a single jar file that will actually include your front-end JavaScript and uh, render it as you'd expect. Um, there's a bit of configuration involved here and we'll take a look at that. And there's also a Grails guide available um, for this particular very same example um, on the Grails guide site. Um, this is really handy for smaller projects especially or, or for organizations where you don't have a, uh, a pipeline for deploying a standalone JavaScript uh, application, for example. Um, you can use an approach like this to combine the two projects and end up with a single artifact to deploy that has the uh, front end included with the back end, which is you know, basically the same uh, experience you would get with a traditional Grails application with GSPs. And so this, this can be a nice uh, trick if you're introducing a single page application architecture in an organization that's not really set up to um, deploy the front end separately. Obviously there's advantages to deploying it separately because it lets you update the front end separately from the back end and there's, there's definitely flexibility there. But if that's not flexibility you need, if that's actually you know, more, com if that's more complexity than, than is worth for you, um, you can uh, use this uh, combined build um, approach. And we, we, at OCI, we do this a lot with um, IoT sort of applications. We wanna run on say a Raspberry Pi, a small computing device, and we don't wanna have to run two servers. We'll just create an executable jar file that includes both our front end and our back end and drop that on the device. And it makes it really easy to stand up a, a full stack application. So um, not gonna be the solution for everyone, um, but it's a, a tip that I think is worth knowing about and hopefully we'll get to see it um, here shortly. Uh, okay, so a few more slides here. We're gonna just briefly do a high level uh, uh, discussion of uh, JWT security with Spring Security REST. And then we'll jump into the demo and hopefully get to see all the stuff in action. So uh, there was a question earlier about Spring Security Core, and absolutely you can use Spring Security Core uh, with Vue. The, uh, the factor with Spring Security uh, uh, by default is that it's using a session-based uh, authentication scheme. And that means that there's a state, there's state kept on the server, and there's usually uh, a cookie or something that you use to keep track of your session ID. And the server basically decides when the session is valid and when it expires and so forth. And that's sort of the standard Spring Security Core uh, model. Um, however, Spring Security REST um, enables a stateless authentication model. So this means that we're using tokens instead of sessions. And this means that there is no state on the server. Instead, when the uh, user authenticates, the server will generate a token 
that will contain all the information about the user that is necessary for their authentication and authorization. So that token will include details about their role. It'll include, um, it'll have basically the expiration will be pre-baked into the token. Um, and this approach is really designed for securing RESTful APIs, uh, which is uh, basically what you're doing uh, if you're if you are um, building a single page application that's backed by a rest API um, token based authentication tends to be the uh, the way you want to go uh, you can certainly use the traditional spring security um, um, uh, authentication model and I've seen it done um, but it's it's not as it, it's it's not as um, I'm not sure I, I want to go into it, into the, the differences why you might do one or the other. So suffice it to say that stateless token-based authentication is much more typical uh, for building a single page application. I'm, I'm not going to go into the, I, I didn't really prepare to, to go into the details for why you do one or the other. It, it's not required. You can do it with the, the, the session cookie way, um, but there, there are advantages to doing it in the stateless uh, manner. Um, but that's a, a topic for a talk on Spring Security REST, which I, I don't have time to do right now. Um, and Spring Security REST uh, supports uh, multiple token types as well. We're going to be looking at JWT, which is JSON Web Tokens. Those are the most, um, probably the most popular format. Um, but you can also have um, GORM, um, basically domain class tokens, which uh, is pretty powerful because it lets, you, it lets you actually have state in addition to a token. Um, you can use Redis, Memcache. There's a lot of options for how, how you want to handle uh, both the, the token and how you store it. Um, and so to use the plugin, uh, you simply add the dependency to your build.gradle file. And, it's, um, and there's some default configuration you need to add. And um, the documentation covers all of that. Uh, JWT, JSON Web Token, is just an, an open standard for how to uh, uh, represent uh, claims, which loosely corresponds to authorities or roles. So this is basically a, a standard way of, of, of indicating uh, that this particular user, consumer of the API, has or at least claims to have these abilities, these roles, for example. And there's a, a format that's standard here. There's an encoding um, standard. We're not going to go into all of that because you don't really have to. It's, it's basically handled for you by the uh, Spring Security REST plugin. Um, but that's what we're going to be using in this example. So when you're doing a token-based authentication, this is basically the flow. And um, this is not specific to JWT, even though we're going to be using JWT in, in our case. Um, the basic idea is that the uh, client is going to make a request for some resource, and if they are not authenticated, if they don't have the correct authorization, they're going to get a 401. And then the client should respond to that 401 by prompting the user to provide login credentials. So let's say a username or password, if that's what you're doing. And then it's going to post those uh, credentials to a defined login endpoint. The server then is going to validate the credentials. It's going to figure out if this user is valid and what their roles are. And, it, and then the server will generate a token. Now, the diagram here says that it's going to generate and store the token. That's not necessary. Um, and in fact, in Grails with Spring Security REST, the token is not stored by default. You can store it, but you'll have to, to um, you know, create a domain class or something to do that persistence. But in any case, the server will generate the token and return it to the client. The token then is going to have some sort of an access key that the client is going to include in, in the authorization header for all future requests. So now when the client makes the same request, it's gonna have an additional header, an authorization header, that will include that token. And then so long as that token is valid and, and provides access to the resource, to the, the API endpoint, for example, in question, the server will, will respond with the resource. And that will continue to work until that token expires. And there is a flow here for doing uh, refresh and reloading tokens as well. Um, but that's the basic flow here. So you can see that it's stateless because once the server generates the token, it doesn't really keep track of what, what's happening with it after that point. Um, the token will expire on its own, and when it expires, the server will start returning 401s, and the client will have to either try to refresh the token um, or prompt the user to log in again. So that's the basic flow there, as opposed to a session where the server will create a session with an ID, return the ID as a, uh, a cookie, for example, and then the server basically controls when the session times out and so forth. So there's advantages to both of these approaches. And again, I just don't have time to go into that topic right now. And I don't have any material on that right now. But um, we're going to be looking at this JWT model, since that is d dominantly the, the, the most popular way to do security in, um, in single page applications uh, these days.
So with that, we are ready for our demo. So I'm going to move some things around here. And uh, we got about 15 minutes left, or just a little under that. I think that should be enough. Uh, we'll put this uh, WebStorm project away. And so what I have here now, hopefully everyone can see my IDE. What I have here now is a uh, Grails application built with the view uh, profile. I can demonstrate that by going, well, let me see if I can find it here. Um, there it is. So if I go to the build.gradle file, I can see that we are using the uh, uh, view profile for this project. So let's go ahead and look at the project structure here real, real quick. We got a Gradle, uh, a server um, sub project. This is our Grails application. There's our Grails app directory. And then separately from that, we have our client application. The client directory, uh, this is a view uh, CLI project. So you'll notice the project structure is quite different. We have a source directory, which includes our components and other artifacts uh, for the view application. And then we have a public directory that includes our default index HTML page. Um, so that's a, a pretty typical um, Vue.js uh, format. Let's see, we got more questions here. Uh, okay. So um, let's go ahead and, and uh, fire this application up and then we'll kind of talk about what it does from there. So let's go ahead and start up the Grails application first. So I'm gonna use IntelliJ um, to start up the Grails application now. Um, this was running a minute ago, so hopefully it won't take uh, too long to figure out its dependencies. So again, this Grails application has no uh, UI and it is secured. Uh, let me show you that actually while it's running. So we have Spring Security Core and Spring Security REST installed. You can see them there in our build.gradle file. And if we go to our uh, application.yaml configuration file, you can see that we have um, uh, Grails plugin Spring Security. None of this stuff here is specific to what we're doing. This is just the standard configuration that you will get uh, when you um, actually when you fire it, when you use the, um, the quick start command that's provided by the Spring Security um, and Spring Security REST plugin. So this is all just default configuration to set up the default um, uh, rules for different URL patterns. You can see, for example, we're uh, making sure that people aren't blocked from accessing JavaScript and CSS files. None of this really matters in our case right, right now because the uh, server doesn't have any of those files. Um, but um, that's all set up there by default. Um, I'm not gonna, again, we don't have time to talk about Spring Security REST. Um, if you wanna learn more about that, look up uh, Alvaro Sanchez's uh, workshop on that topic. It's a, a great resource. All right, looks like our server's up and running now. So let's go ahead and look at that. So this is the, uh, the default um, JSON output. And um, you can see that we have a list of our controllers. So notice that we do have our login and logout controller. Those are provided by Spring Security. And then we also have a book controller. So this is where our, our application starts to come into focus. So let's go ahead and look at that. Um, if we look in our project, look under uh, Grails app and domain, we can see that we have a book, a book domain class. So we are, uh, this is a simple domain class, two string properties, should be all familiar to you if you've done anything with Grails. Uh, and notice we we're using the at resource annotation that's provided by Grails. And what the resource annotation does is it will generate a RESTful controller for this domain class. Uh, there's several options you can provide to it. I'm just specifying a default URI. So we're saying that slash API slash book is gonna be the URL to access um, book, the, the book um, endpoints. And then we're also saying that this API is gonna be secured and that the user role is required uh, in order to access it. And we can actually demonstrate that now by if we go to our server here and try to hit API slash book, this should return us a list of books, but instead we are gonna get a 401 page. And because we're in a browser, we're getting this weird HTML uh, error page. Um, but you can see that we got the 401 and that's what we expected because we're not, we are not authenticated. And so the, um, the at secured uh, annotation is preventing us from accessing that resource. Um, so that's, that's basically our API. Now, obviously in a real application, you're going to probably want to have your own RESTful controller. So you have more control over the actual logic uh, in the controller. However, for a demo like this, and if you ever have just a bunch of domain classes that you need to make quickly available, um, and you don't have a lot of custom logic, um, the resource annotation is a, is a pretty slick tool for doing that. So this, we don't have to do any URL mappings or controllers or anything. Um, this annotation generates all of that for us. So that's pretty handy. So that's basically our API. Uh, we don't have any other controllers here, just um, 
the application controller, which is uh, provided by default. We're not doing anything with that. Um, I do have some code in the bootstrap to create a user. So notice that we have user and role domain classes. Those are all specific to Spring Security. I'm not gonna talk about those right now, but suffice it to say I have code to create a default user. So I can log in if I have the right, if I use the right credentials, I can authenticate against this server. So let's go ahead and fire up the Vue.js application um, so we can see what that looks like. So that's gonna be the serve um, task. My slides are actually out of date there. Uh, that's one thing that's changed. The start um, script has been changed to serve in the latest version of UCLI. So I changed the Gradle task to match because I want those names to basically be aliases. So the command to start it is now client colon serve. And that will start up the server. So that should be running here shortly. There we go. And there we are. So here is our Vue.js um, application. Now you can already see that this is looks a lot like a default Grails application. Um, and that's by design, that's, it's made, to, but this is not implemented with GSP. This is all implemented with um, Angular. Oh, I'm sorry, with Angular, with Vue.js. So let's go ahead and look at that real quickly here. If we look in the client directory and look under our source, we can see we have an app, direct, an app component, which um, uh, is actually used for routing, uh, which we don't do any routing in this application, but routing basically lets you have uh, URLs within your single page application. It's a big topic and we're not gonna go into it right now. But if we go into our components here, we can see that we have a welcome component. This welcome component is what's rendering all of that, um, this page you see here. So all of that markup, all the HTML and CSS, that's all being rendered out by this, this component here. Um, so a lot of this is just default stuff, um, CSS, a lot of HTML, but we do have some logic here. Uh, we do actually have some, uh, a login form and some stuff going on. So let's look at what, what, how the app works and then we'll see what the code is doing behind the scenes. So first we can see we're being confronted with a login page, which makes sense because we have a secured API and we want to be able to access that API. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in the default credentials that I've already um, bootstrapped. And we'll click login and let's see if this works. And there we go, we're logged in. We don't have any data yet, but we can see we're now seeing a different UI. We've got a, a simple form, and then we have a table with no rows, no data. Let's look at how that login works real fast. So here we are looking at our welcome component. This is sort of the main application um, component uh, for this particular app. Um, we can see that in our data function, one of the properties we are returning is access token. And we see it's just set to null by default. So by default, when you load the page, we don't have an access token. And that means we cannot access any secured APIs. Um, so if we look up here in our template and right here, we have a bit of logic we check if we have an access token or rather if we, if we do, if we, if our access token is not null, we render out some markup here. If it is null, we're going to render, so that's a V else right here. We're going to render our login form. The login form is pretty simple. It just has a couple of fields to capture username and password. And notice the login form doesn't actually submit anything to the server, right? The login form is going to call a, a, a submit login function, which was passed into the form as a prop. Um, if you're familiar with React, um, that's props are basically the same um, as in React. They are attributes that you can pass into your function. So if you look back at our, at our uh, welcome component here, notice that on our login form component, we are saying, uh, we are setting this, the submit login attribute to something called login. We'll look at that in just a second here. But if you look in there, that submit login is the same here as in our props um, list. And so this is a function that we can call. We don't know what it does. The login form doesn't know it. It doesn't actually know what submit login does, but it knows how to pass the username and password into it. And the, that way the, the login form delegates delegates the actual logic for doing the, uh, the login call. So it's just a generic form. It could log into anything um, if it was provided with the correct callback. And this is essentially a callback uh, prop. So we jump back here. Let's look at what the login actually does. So we'll command click on here. So login is a method. We talked about methods earlier. So it's a method on our welcome component. Um, it accepts a username and password. Then we make a fetch call. Fetch is an Ajax library, uh, or actually it's an Ajax API that's, um, that's uh, I don't know if it's quite 
native JavaScript yet, but it's going to be, become part of JavaScript soon. Um, so we're making a post request. I'm not going to go into details of fetch. Obviously, we just don't have time for that. Uh, but we're making a login request. And then we're parsing the JSON. And we are grabbing the access token out of that response and storing it in our uh, the access token out of the JSON response and storing it in our state. Once we've done that, we can now call our load books uh, method, which will make the call to our book API. And notice here, we have our authorization header. Um, we're passing in the access token. Uh, this format here is the bearer, bearer, bearer token. Um, there's an RFC for this. It's very standard JWT authentication scheme. Nothing specific to Grails here. When we do that, um, now when we make those requests to API slash book, the server will pick up our token. And so long as the token is valid, it will return the data to us. And the same goes for adding a book and deleting a book. They all follow the same basic pattern. Uh, let's jump back to the browser here and see how make sure this works. Okay, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and put in a, a book title here. Um, let's see. There we go. Add a book by one of my favorite authors. And there we go. It's in our. I just got to add some random data here real fast so you can see. We can add lots of data now. If I refresh the page because I have not implemented any way of storing the access token. When I refresh the page, I'm going to be logged out. So if I log back in, and th there are ways around this, you just have to decide how you want to store the token. And there's security concerns there, obviously. But if I log back in, there's the data. So it was persisted. Everything is there like I expect. I can delete rows. That works as I expect. So we have um, secured access to our API, um, which, is, which is great. Um, let's look real quick back here so we can see what the book um, components are doing, re doing really fast here. The book create form, again, is sort of a dumb component. Notice that we're passing in uh, a callback prop um, add book function. And if you look in there, when we submit to create a new book, we don't actually make the Ajax call. We just call our callback function here um, with the, uh, with the, the uh, book object that we're storing on our state. Um, so this is an example of two-way data binding. Again, don't have time for this, but essentially the idea is that when you edit the value in the input it changes the value in the data and vice versa and so this means that whatever we enter into these text fields is going to populate the, ob the book object in our data when we call add book we're, we're going to pass that book object um, to our callback we jump back here and look at what the add book function does it creates a it's a post request we, we uh, create a json string for our body out of the uh, book object and we post that to the, to the server and we expect it to work and it does that's a really whirlwind. I apologize. I know we're going kind of fast. Um, but again, we, we're not going, this is not meant to be a deep dive into Vue.js. Um, so this code is going to be made available. You'll receive a link to it when we send the recording uh, email out. It'll be on GitHub. Um, so you'll be able to see this. Uh, and I'll probably make some improvements to this sample code um, as well um, over the next uh, couple days. But um, this is uh, basically what I wanted to show you. So the last thing I'm going to do, and if folks at the drop off, I understand. I'm just going to run this really fast because I, I've already done it. And I'm reasonably confident that it still works. So I've actually configured the combined build that I talked about uh, previously. And what that means is that I can run a command like this, assemble server and client. This is a custom Gradle task I've written um, that will generate both the client uh, front, the, both the Vue.js application as well as the uh, Grails application. It's going to combine the two into a single jar file. So notice that we are building uh, for production. So we're making a production build of the Vue app. That's been done. Now that the Vue app is built, the Grails application is going to be packaged as well. And Gradle, I'll show you that command here, is going to copy the uh, front end application. Uh, it's right here. It's going to copy the front end application into the build directory of the server application. And that's going to create the combined jar file. And so at this point, assuming that everything goes well here and that I don't have anything else running in the background, I can run java-jar and uh, go to our build directory and run the, oops, sorry about that. Uh, java- I forget where the directory is sometimes. Um, libs, there it is. server-01.jar is the default name of the file. So if this works, we should see our Grails application fire up with a Vue.js front end. So it's a single server. 
a single deployable artifact. You can drop this um, on any, um, any server that runs Java and fire it up with a command just like that. And it's gonna have persistence and everything else set up um, as well. So let's see if this uh, pulls out uh, correctly here. There we go. So now we're going to localhost 8080. Remember that previously we had to go to localhost 3000 to get our front end uh, over here. But now we're on localhost 8080. There's our server. Um, I can go ahead and log in. My user should be there. There we are. I can add data, just like that. Everything works as it did before, but we're now running everything off of a single server. So the configuration for all that um, is detailed in the Grails guide that I'm gonna show you in just a second here. So I'm not gonna go into all that right now. Um, let's go ahead and jump back to the slides and wrap this up. And I will answer more questions when we're done here. So um, like I said, so here, uh, this is a, a bunch of, uh, of links that I recommend you check out. This basically covers pretty much everything except for security that we've done so far. So the, uh, the view profile documentation documents how to use the profile, obviously. Um, I've written a Grails guide on how to build a view application, which is uh, a slightly more complicated version of what we just saw, minus the security portion. And then there's also a Grails guide on creating a combined build with Grails and view. And that's gonna show you how to do the trick I just did now, where I ran that jar file and it had the Vue.js application included. Um, so that's a pretty cool trick. So check out, check that out. And then uh, there's another uh, Grails guide on the on the view profile, but more specifically. So uh, those are the uh, Grails and view resources I wanted to pass along. Uh, that brings me to the end. Um, so I, again, I apologize. I had to go pretty quick there. Um, so I understand if there's, if there's a lot of questions, I'm happy to stick around and, and answer those. Um, but otherwise, I think I'll uh, kick this back to you, Nikki, if you want to uh, bring this home. Yes, that sounds good. So thanks everyone for joining. Please do visit our website at objectcomputing.com slash events and you'll find links to all of our upcoming webinars on this similar topic and more. Thanks again, everyone. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Nikki. So I, I can stick around for a little longer here uh, for any last minute questions. So um, thank you all for joining and uh, feel free to drop off as you need to. So let me uh, take a look here. Um, if I don't want to use the resource annotation in domain class, I need to create a new controller and define the URL for the resource and URL mapping. Um, that is correct. Um, that's pretty much what you do. That's ex ex it's exactly what you would do. Uh, the resource annotation is simply a shortcut. And it's really helpful when you're just getting a new project started. And it can also, I've, I've had instances in production applications where it didn't make sense, where I had a bunch of, of uh, domain classes that just needed a bare minimum API exposed. It was all secured, so it wasn't exposed out, you know, to the outside world. I didn't need to configure it. Um, so there are times where a resource will work, but otherwise you'll create a controller. Uh, references, the hook and a sample for security. Um, I, I would suggest uh, just go ahead and either post on the Grail Slack or, uh, or write to us at OCI. Um, I don't have any information on, on SAML handy right now. Um, let's see, for an enterprise, applica enterprise application, what is your preference for front-end development React or Vue? Excellent question. Um, my preference actually still is React, but that's because I'm a little bit of a JavaScript snob, actually. Um, hopefully not in a, in a, 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 in a unpleasant way, but I'm, I, I, I like how JavaScript works. Um, I like the, uh, the conventions. I like the, even the limitations of the, of the language, especially in the, in the newer versions. And so React is more pure JavaScript, and so that's why it appeals to me. Uh, because I feel like I understand JavaScript pretty well, I kind of know what's going on when I'm using React, where, whereas with Vue, there's a little more magic going on, and that's not a bad thing. It just it's it, it really is a preference, and um, it's up to uh, up to each developer, each team to decide uh, if that's more important to them or not. Um, to be honest, React and Vue are, are very comparable, though. Uh, I don't want to exaggerate the uh, the differences because there's a lot of things they have in common, and they're both very viable um, libraries. Um, let's see. Um, just clicking on some of these off so I can up the list. Is the book in the example by Ken Cousin a real upcoming book? Uh, no comment. Um, actually, uh, it's, not, it's not entirely secret. Um, actually, uh, yes, Ken and I are, are working on uh, an upcoming a book by that title, but uh, no ETA yet. So um, let's see. Any pointers on the best way to persist the access token? Let's see. Within the single page application. Uh, that's a complicated question. So the question is, how do we persist the access token? Um, that's not easy to answer um, because 
the easiest thing to do is to store in local storage, for example. However, there's a lot of security concerns with that. One of the big concerns that you need to keep in mind whenever you're using these front-end frameworks is that you're typically bringing in a lot of other libraries, dependencies that you don't know about and that you don't control. And if any of those dependencies are compromised, well, that's code running on your domain. And so it has access to your local storage. And so a malicious package can access anything you store in local storage or in session storage even because it's all running from the same, uh, the same domain. Uh, so that is a, a concern. Um, the, uh, the most secure option I've seen, and if you Google this, you'll probably find the same article I'm talking about, but um, is to use an HTTP only cookie, a secured cookie. Um, is is one of the safer ways that's um, for for uh, storing access tokens. Otherwise, which is the other option, is simply don't persist it. Uh, keep it within your state and try to write your app in such a way that the user does not have to refresh it, and they should be able to keep using it. Um, but you know that's not always not always a viable option. So, um, yep, I I can't give you the the definitive answer on that, but it's definitely something you need to con to um, consider. Um, so that covers both of those questions there. Uh, what advantage or disadvantage would there be in using this same type of application, a view app, and a RESTful controller in Micronaut versus Grails 4? That's a great question. And we had a similar question about that earlier, about Grails versus uh, Grails 4 specifically versus Micronaut. Uh, that's a big topic, but I think what I the way I like to think of it is that Micronaut is really designed to make microservices easy. Um, and, and to make you productive when working with microservices. And so if you're building a microservice architecture and you want to include a single page application and you need to have a, a RESTful backend, for example, uh, the, yeah, I would use Micronaut. There's, no, no, there's certainly no problem using, using Micronaut. Now there are some things that you get in Grails that you don't have in Micronaut. And a big one for me is JSON views. Um, JSON views currently is not, does not work with Micronaut uh, largely because it requires Groovy and Micronaut does not require Groovy. Um, and so Grails 4 gives me a really expressive way of, express, of, of, of defining my JSON output from my API. I really value that. And so if I'm not specifically building this as part of a microservice federation where I need to talk to other services and do you know, event-driven stuff or whatever, uh, or, or you know, reactive um, uh, flows across multiple services and so forth, if I'm not doing any of that, then Grails 4 has a lot going for it. There's a lot of features in it that, you know, just because Micronaut is more of a microservice focused framework, uh, it's not gonna necessarily include. So it's not a ding against Micronaut or against Grails. They're just both designed for specific um, uh, use cases. And so if I'm, if I'm working in a microservice federation, I'm probably gonna lean towards Micronaut. If I'm not, or if the front end and the, and, and the associated RESTful backend are standalone enough, then I might still consider using Grails 4, even in a microservice federation, especially because now that we have Micronaut um, in, included, essentially, or at least uh, a Micronaut features included within Grails 4, um, now it's, it's even more compelling because I can use Micronaut clients, for example, to talk to other Micronaut services from my Grails 4 application, um, which gives me kind of the best of both worlds. So I think there's still a lot of advantages to using Grails 4, especially if you have, if you're, um, uh, building a single page application, but I've done both. I've used Micronaut, I've used Grails um, specifically for uh, as a backend for Vue.js. They both work just fine. Um, is the spa a poire? Is the single page application a progressive web application? Uh, this particular one is not. Um, there is support for progressive web applications in Vue, um, but the solution for that is gonna be the same as with any Vue.js application. There's nothing uh, Grail specific about that. Um, and then we have, can we use Vue.js inside of GSP views? You absolutely can do that. If you're gonna do that, I would recommend using the, um, the, the, the standard uh, web profile probably. Um, yeah, that's what I would recommend. Use, use the, the default Grails profile with GSPs and then um, grab the Vue.js library, uh, either using the, um, you, the uh, script tag that I showed at the beginning of the talk, or there's other ways you can pull it in. In fact, there's actually a Gradle, a Gradle plugin that will let you install dependencies like Vue from, no, from NPM uh, without using NPM at all. And so that's probably what I would do. Um, I, would, I would use the, the stock Grails web profile with GSPs, and I would 
put a div on my GSP and I would have a script tag and instantiate my view instance and give it that IDs, that divs ID and go from there. So yeah, very, very doable. Not a single page application, so that's why I didn't talk about it, but definitely doable. Let's see, GSP and server said rendering dead in your opinion. That's a good question. Uh, so uh, there's, the, there's the ability in Java uh, to render um, JavaScript on the server and um, output the, the render HTML. And what this lets you do is lets you uh, save or skip that initial render call. Uh, when you first, off when you load up a single page application, there'll be this blank screen while the browser you know, crunches all the JavaScript to get this thing, to get the app rendered. You don't have that problem if you can render this on the server. And so there is the ability in Java to do that. I won't say it's dead. I would say that it's, it's not catching on the way that I think some folks thought it might. Um, I, I suspect it probably is being used by folks for specific use cases. Um, the, the obvious one is if SEO is really important and you really need to return straight HTML right away. Although I think that's becoming less of an issue because search engines are getting smarter um, about how they, they handle that. Two-way data binding versus one-way data binding. I agree with you, uh, Angel. One-way data binding does improve predictability in client state. That's a big reason why I like React. Um, Two-way data binding is more intuitive for folks sometimes and is obviously you know, more convenient. Um, so I think it's a matter of, of uh, developer preference there. Um, but I, I do appreciate the more deterministic one-way binding. Um, use vanilla Grails or a single page appro approach? Yeah, I mean, don't build a single page if you don't need it. Uh, if, you, if you don't have developers that are familiar with that and you don't actually have use cases for it, um, it's certainly not a requirement. That There's still advantages to a, a server-side rendered static UI and um, there's no need to write everything in, in Vue or React just because it's the new thing. Um, that said, um, you know, if you are interested in things like progressive web applications and you are interested in um, uh, some of these other modern um, uh, JavaScript uh, tools that are out there, you know, there's a whole ecosystem out there that you might appreciate and that might be useful to you. So there's certainly, it's certainly worth looking into uh, going more for a single page application approach. But um, I don't think that it's a, it's a requirement. I mean, jQuery still works, still being developed. And uh, there's still plenty of folks that, that like that. So I don't think that it's, it's a requirement, but you know, be, keep an eye on what's going on out there because you don't want to end up in a situation where you can't find developers and you, and you, uh, you don't, don't have a, a good handle of what's going on. So yeah, I think I'm gonna call it, call it at this point, but thank you all for the good questions. Um, hopefully this was uh, helpful for you all. And uh, if you have any feedback, any additional questions, go ahead and um, uh, uh, send them either via email or, or Slack. And I, I do recommend check out the Grail Slack channel. There's a lot more people on it than, I, than me and, um, and lots of folks are willing to help. But feel free to flag me on the Slack channel. I'm not always on it every day, but if people ping me, I will check in and answer. So with that said, uh, we're over time. Thank you all. And I think I'm gonna uh, call it at this point.